This episode could be triggering for sensitive listeners and contains mature content. It may not be suitable to all listeners. Should you need any emotional assistance, please see the show notes for telephone numbers that you can call. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are my own and do not reflect the official policy or position of the podcast. Any content provided by contributors such as the host, guests, bloggers, sponsors or authors are of their opinion and are not intended to malign any religion, group, club, organization, company, individual or anyone or anything. Before we get into today's episode, I need to say thank you to Marlene. Your support in this new endeavor of mine has been truly incredible. I also need to thank Gabby. Your feedback and advice on my podcast has been invaluable. I really appreciate you both so much. Daniel Schricker, PhD, is a composer and writer based in Adelaide, Australia. He completed his undergraduate and postgraduate studies at the University of Adelaide, being awarded a PhD in 2020. His doctoral research examined Arnold Schoenberg's concept of developing variation from a compositional perspective. Other areas of interest include cults and fringe religion groups, which have occupied some of his recent writings. This is Decoding Cults, and I'm your host Paul D. You are listening to KSB, Interview with Daniel Tricker, Part 1. This week, I had the extreme privilege of chatting to Daniel, and I really hope you enjoyed this episode. Daniel Schricker, PhD. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. I'm very, very happy that you're here. Um, and I would just like you to tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and maybe a little bit about your background within the group. Sure. Well, firstly, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a, actually a composer based in Adelaide, Australia. And um, so that's what my PhD was in. It was in music. And I was born in, in Germany and spent the first eight years of my life there. So my initial contact with Kwasi Zabantu was through the, the conferences that they started running in Europe. So by the time I was born, uh, my mother in particular was attending the conferences regularly. In fact, she was at the very first European conference that they ran there. And so that was my initial exposure to KSB. And during that time, we also moved to Kwasi to South Africa just for a short stint. So we were there for about six months. And my mother worked at Radio Kwesi, which is the radio station on the mission. And not too long after that, we moved to Australia. And it just really coincidentally, we discovered that uh, Friedel Stegen, who was the leader's brother, was in Australia. And it turned out that there was a relatively small congregation uh, across his Abantu Australia branch that was in, in the area. And we ended up joining that particular church. And so that was actually where I spent most of my time under KSB. I did go back to KSB South Africa for a short visit in 2005, and that was just a, with another member of the, the church uh, in Australia. So, yeah, basically between being born, the age of being born, and the age of almost 18, um, I was connected with Kwasi Zabantu in one way or another, um, both in Europe, South Africa, and then Australia. Wow. Okay. Thank you. And then um, one of the, the great things that I've about you that I've found is you wrote a full part like paper about Kwasi Zabantu, which I spoke to in one of my episodes. And you basically speak about the, the fear that is instilled and especially how it impacts you from being a child. So the four parts are fear of God, fear of authority, fear of self, and fear of the outside world, which mm-hmm. is pretty culty. So um, what made you want 
to write that and all of the examples and things that you used um, was any of that personal examples like stuff that happened to you um it was really both I mean I'm of course writing from experience myself so in terms of the the long-term implications of growing up in that system um anxiety would have to be one of the main ones that um I still struggle with and I, I think what became apparent through all of the news stories and the articles and the documentary uh, was that there, there was you know, a substantial number of people from my generation um, and even the generation before that were um, wrestling with the exact same kinds of psychological um, issues, having grown up in KSB in one way or another. And I, I think that the really good thing about the immediate attention, attention that was put on Kwasi Zabantu was um, having so many sources from which to draw, and I'm sure you've found that helpful in, in the creation of podcasts about the group as well. Um, there's always been a, a web, well, not always, but the, for quite some time, there's been a website run by ex-members, um, KSB Alert. So there, there have been some resources out there, but um, just the, the kind of flurry of, of articles and um, the, the attention that was given to the mission made it easier to kind of have a lot of different sources to draw on. So, because I, I did want to avoid it just being, well, this is what I experienced, because the, the argument that can be made then is, well, so what, you're just one person, we can point to a whole bunch of people that have had a positive experience at KSB. And so, uh, the sources that I've included, you know, are, are people from different backgrounds, different ages, and, and even um, different times that they were at the mission and things like that. And I think it just gives a bit more of an overview to, to prove that this was actually a systemic thing and not just, you know, the psychological disposition of a handful of people, um, but that, you know, many, many people were affected in the exact same way. So that was really the motivation behind it. And um, I, I suppose, yeah, there is the personal aspect of having grown up in, in Kwasi Zabantu in my formative years and knowing firsthand just how devastating that is when you're still learning about the world and you're developing your worldview at that age. And so, you know, your critical thinking isn't quite as developed, obviously, as when you're an adult. So, you know, I think the, the impact of it on children was particularly devastating and certainly the, the testimonies that are coming out now um, are proof of that. And your experience between the three different missions that you were at, so starting obviously in Germany when you went to all those things and then moving on here to South Africa to Kau. Sorry about my, <laughs> I stumbled over my words so badly with Erica as well. I'm not so sorry. sorry. I'm not editing any of this stuff out. <laughs> uh, okay. so, like the, the difference between like the, the European mission, the home mission, the South African mission, and then the Australian mission, was there some difference? I know obviously when the European one, you were quite young, but I don't know if you can recall anything that was kind of different or, or maybe easier to be at the other missions than at the Natal mission or maybe easier to be at the Natal mission than the other missions, um, just those kind of things. Sure. Um, yeah, so in terms of the European sector and also the, the Australian sector when I was involved with it, um, that was really headed up by Friedel Stegen, um, Ali's brother. He tended to be a little bit milder just in his personality and in, in the way that he kind of enforced things than, than Al of himself. Um, having said that, the they did essentially, especially once the churches, so initially what happened is you had the conferences being run by um, Kwasi Zabantu, and I believe they happened twice a year normally, and they would really just send out um, a number of preachers. Uh, sometimes Alo did come as well, but usually it was, it was more Friedel. Sometimes uh, other people came as well, especially in the early days. And so eventually it generated enough interest that these conferences were being attended by several thousand people. And so naturally the, the next step kind of from that was that a number of KSB churches were officially planted around Europe. So you had, you had a group, uh, well, actually there's still a KSB church in Romania. Um, there were churches in France, Switzerland, Germany. So the work kind of expanded and eventually they also 
started a KSB school um, in Europe. I didn't end up attending the school, although my parents were considering it for a while. Um, but I have heard just very recently that the school is now under investigation for child abuse as well. I think that was probably the, the main aspect of it that was kind of similar to KSB South Africa in terms of the severity of, of things like the treatment of children. Um, I didn't like experience any abuse or anything at the, the conferences myself in, in Europe. Um, but in terms of the, the theological aspects of it, that was all essentially the same. I mean, they were bringing the, the sort of the KSB gospel, if you will, into Europe. And so obviously it took a while for things to get going. But once they once they became sort of systematized in Europe as well, they, they were teaching some of the, the same kinds of strange doctrines, particularly in relation to confession of sin and, and their rather unique way of getting married and things like that. Yeah, sure. So you you got out before you needed to get married. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, my my sister received a proposal of marriage just before we left um, KSB Australia, but yeah, I was I was just a little bit too young to really um, go through any of that. Um, well, since you are the the male, and I've only spoken to the on, from the from a, a, the female perspective of being at KSB. Um, one of the things specifically about marriage that I wanted to know is um, do, do you like look at a girl and go, okay, I want her and then go to Uncle Ulla or Friedel or whoever your leader is in your group and say, okay, I want to marry her? Or do you think, do, do they come to you and go, hey, did you see her? She's got nice ankles. And then you <laughs> and kind of like, you know, plant the seed for you to eventually go, okay, now I've, I think I need to marry her. Or do you think the guys do choose themselves? Yeah, I think for the most part, it did come from the guys themselves. Now, I have heard a number of testimonies where it did seem like the leadership was at the very least sort of trying to manipulate and pull some strings in terms of getting people together. But I'm not aware that the marriages were ever arranged in a formal <laughs> sense. Um, what, what did tend to happen, though, is that there was a very distinct hierarchy within KSB, both in Australia and South Africa. And so I think that came into it as well, you know, where you kind of were in the church. Um, I mean, I think there was probably also an aspect of that guys, because they had nothing else to go on except looks. I mean, I suspect that became a pretty uh, important factor, as much as they would deny that if I said that to them, because that's far too unsanctified, you know, to admit that. But just the, the reality of, of biology and human nature, you know, yeah. um, I think that certainly did take place as well. I mean, the, the kind of comical thing about the whole marriage thing is that it was always framed as being well, God has shown me to marry this girl. They wouldn't really say, well, I think she's kind of cute and, um, you know, I want to get married, so how about it sort of thing. It was always framed in, well, God has shown this young man to propose to you or to marry you or something. And the, the kind of farcical aspect of that, as I'm sure Erica pointed out to you as well, is that you had, you know, women who were getting multiple proposals from different men and um so apparently god was <laughs> you know slight, slightly getting confused from their perspective on on the whole thing and that that's where it really descended into a bit of silliness sure okay <laughs> sorry then obviously with growing up there you you grew up with you grew up there with children more or less your own age was it also kind of a I'm your friend, but I can't really share with you because you're going to snitch on me if I don't confess or if I have any doubts or any any questions about the faith. Was it like that for you guys as well? Not so much in Australia, no. That, that was something I think, um, well, it may have been the case, particularly at the school in Europe, but um, I think that was something that was uh, mostly emphasised in South Africa. In, in Australia, there was quite a distinct hierarchy within the church, and it was a unique kind of demographic as well, because the church essentially consisted of one really large extended family. So the pastor was one of 11 children, and his parents were in the church, as were all of his siblings, except for a, a couple that eventually moved to KSB South Africa because they married uh, men from over there. Um, so you you kind of um especially once people started getting married and having kids 
the, the majority of the church was still this, this large extended family. So what that meant is that if you happen to not be part of that group, it was very easy to sort of feel yourself somewhat disenfranchised. And, and that was the case in my family as well. We weren't related and we weren't married into one of the important families. So yeah, there was this very distinct hierarchy and you were always aware. Um, the other thing that was terribly important to the church in Australia was money, uh, simply put. Um, they, they, the, the family runs an extremely lucrative um, bakery franchise here. And um, so that, that also, I think, affected, you know, how people viewed you as well. But no, um, in terms of the, the snitching itself, that wasn't really something that took place in the same way as South Africa. We, we did have instances of bullying uh, in, in the church, which were very problematic, and the, the leadership sort of turned a blind eye, blind eye to it, even when it was brought to their attention. So that, that was probably the, the main kind of problematic aspect of the, the socialising with the, the young people. Sure. Okay. So there was definitely like a, if you were in with the family, you were above everyone else kind of vibe yeah. thing. Okay. Right. I mean, I suppose, I suppose the other thing worth mentioning that, and this is where it gets a little bit silly as well, is, you know, most of the people being related, but they still enforced the same kind of segregation as in South Africa between the genders. So if you walked into the Australian branch of KSB on a given Sunday morning, what you would immediately see as you came in the back of the church would be the, the single young men sitting on the left of the church. Then you had the, the aisle of the church down the middle and then the single women on the, on the right and near the twain shall meet kind of thing, you know. So there was still this, this very enforced separation of the genders. Um, you know, absolutely no dating, no texting between the, the opposite sex. Um, so, and, and in some ways they, again, took it to kind of comically absurd extremes to in, enforce that, you know. So did you guys just have services on the Sunday or was it also like a, a daily or a twice a day um, service or congregation thing? Uh, they had it on a Sunday for quite a long time, just a Sunday morning service. They did then start running a weekly Wednesday night service as well, mm -hmm. um, which I think those were fairly well attended. I didn't go all of the time, but um, quite a few people did. Um, they never really ran anything in the way of like prayer groups or Bible studies. Um, in fact, I, I suspect that they were a little bit suspicious about that kind of thing because, you know, it's kind of detrimental to a high control group if you get small numbers within the church that are starting to talk about things on their own terms and mm. looking at the Bible for themselves. You know, I think they would much rather have all of the information being controlled in terms of what the pastor is saying and things like that. Okay. So you, you kind of touched on two things that I wanted to speak to you about. The first one is obviously, um, so there's the family with the bakery and, and all of that, but did, did you, like your family and families that weren't part of the, let's call it the core group of family, did they, you guys have like outside careers and like you had, your parents had a regular job, but they just happened to go to the KSB church or was it very much involved everyone at the bakery, for example? Yeah, so it wasn't prohibited to kind of work outside of the church's domain but having said that many many of the young people were kind of groomed to to go into the the family business or the church business the, the bakery uh, my mother and sister also worked in the bakery for a number of years and the the one thing that was unique about the australian group of ksb is that for many years they were vehemently opposed to education so my sisters and I, and then eventually the very youngest sister of the pastor were the only ones, as far as I recall, that actually finished high school. Um, and my mother came under a, a, a fair amount of pressure from other people in the church that we were even, even being allowed to finish high school and certainly attend university. Um, I mean, I, I left the, the group in just towards the end of my final year of high school, so... That in fact, you know, someone came to my mother at one point and and said, you know, why why are your daughters going to university? They should mm. be going into the bakery. So there, there was a kind of social pressure to conform. And of course, for many of the young people, the prospect of leaving high school early, especially because education was not something that was presented to them as important, it meant um, 
you know, a certain amount of independence and also, of course, a, you know, a great deal of income uh, at a very young age. And so money was very important to a lot of them. So it kind of seemed appealing at the time. But what ended up happening is then when they when some of them reached sort of their mid to late 20s and they've had kids and everything, then they suddenly realized, hey, it would have actually been nice to, to go to university. And fairly recently, so I think two or three years ago, the the um, the church also started a Domino Civite school in Australia, mm. and um, which concerns me on some levels because it means that the the access that the children have to the outside world is now even more restricted. Because at least, even though they didn't finish high school, at least they were being put into you know other Christian schools. Um, so it does concern me that that's going on. I suppose the only positive from that is that there's a little bit more kind of emphasis on or, or at least permission to pursue education in, in some ways mm. and um, it, it was somewhat comical also that um, because they they named the school Domino Civite here and then when all of the allegations broke and they sort of officially were forced to cut ties with KSB they rather awkwardly had to rename the school because you know if you type in Domino Civite there's that's not a particularly good public image that the, the prospective parents are going to come across when they're looking online you know. Mm. So do they take in, I don't know if you know, but would, would they take in people or children from outside of the group or faith, or do they mostly cater to people within the KSB congregation? Um, I think, I mean, so you have to remember there's something like 50 children now in that congregation alone. Wow. Um, so I think its initial intent was probably to provide kind of a, a haven for their own children, but they have accepted, you know, enrollments from just the community. I think those would probably still be in the minority. Okay. Um, and yeah, so I've, I've recently heard that they've um, kind of put in a principle from within the church as well. Um, so, cause previously they actually brought in somebody who was well qualified. Mm. And, um, so again, it's, it'll be interesting to, to see the direction that it goes. Do you still have any contact with anyone inside the mission that you were in at the Australian branch? Uh, not really. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the, it's not, the, the rule really is that, um, you know, they, highly discourage you know any any kind of contact with people that have left um it's not that they wouldn't like feel comfortable to like if they passed me on the street they they wouldn't just ignore me and walk by well some of them might but most of them would would stop and have a chat you know um so it's not like that severe that they would feel guilty about that or something like that but of course to them you you know we've abandoned the the truest form of christianity um, and I think from their perspective as well, they would probably assume that by leaving, we're kind of separating ourselves from them. I don't know that it would actually occur to them that this is this is abnormal, you know, just because we kind of go to a different church, there shouldn't necessarily be this complete separation. So, I mean, to answer your question, no, I, I don't really have any meaningful ongoing contact with anybody in the church. Okay. Um, and, and that was always KSB policy. And when someone does leave the church in that way or say of their own volition, do they kind of talk behind their back, like put them down and say, oh, no, they're evil. They've chosen the wrong path. You can't speak to them. They're going to drag you down to their level and you're never going to get to heaven and those kind of things. Yeah, I mean, the, the people were absolutely vilified. And um, again, this was a feature that was kind of adopted directly from KSB South Africa, you know. Um, I've, I've heard stories where family members have not even attended, you know, weddings of their sons or, or brother or whatever. Um, they were still Christians. They were still church going people, but mm. just because they chose to get to know their spouse prior to the wedding, that was, you know, deemed a serious enough issue in their worldview to essentially cut off contact with that person, you know, and, and in fact, you would come under a fair amount of pressure from the group if you ignored that as, I mean, as in the case of this couple who were, you know, basically forced to leave the church at that point. Mm. Yeah, I, I recently heard from a, another um, ex-member from here that uh, there was a, a lady that's still very much with the church that came to Gauteng to come and do something for the church and her, her children were, uh, had left 
And she, in the meantime, had gotten a, um, a grandchild and she had gone to visit the grandchild. And obviously someone told. And when she got back to the church, she kind of had to like beg for their forgiveness because um, she was so sinful in going to meet her grandchild for the first time. Like, was there anything like that on your side as well? So if you did happen to speak to someone outside of the group, you'd have to go ask for forgiveness. I've, I've definitely heard, you know, countless stories of that sort of thing, just in the KSB circles in general. Um, in some ways, it probably wasn't quite that severe, partly just because I think it was harder for the leadership of the Australian branch to exercise that kind of authority because the advantage, if you want to use that term, that South Africa has, of course, is that they're all kind of isolated within a geographical space where, where yeah. it's relatively easy to keep tabs on who's doing what, you know. Yeah. Um, and in fact, that's always a little bit of a warning sign as well, you know, when you have these isolated, you know, compounds or communities. Um, so it was it was difficult to enforce that in the same way in Australia. And, and for example, it was a little bit more relaxed. So the, the couple that um, I've talked about that were kind of excommunicated from the church, I, I do know that the even the son that remained loyal to the mission would would still go and visit them. They do have some uh, contact, but I think it's it's still quite strained because of the the tension of you know part of the family being loyal to the mission and part of the family not anymore. You know that sentence was actually quite interesting. So it kind of feels like yes, yes, you believe in God, but like it boils down to your your loyalty to the mission more than your belief in the faith and the teaching. So if you're not loyal to the mission, then you're in trouble. So it, it's, it kind of almost feels like it's not necessarily about faith. Faith is the tool that they're using, but they want you to be loyal to the mission. But, am I reading Absolutely. that right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's what it was all about. They, they would often frame it in terms of are you for or against the revival kind of thing. So really, with Kwasi Zabandu, everything comes back to their revival. Um, to, to turn against the mission was to turn against the revival, and, and they would kind of equivocate that with turning against God himself. I mean, there's, there's quotes from Erlo Stegen where he literally says that, you know, if, if you leave revived Christians, and by that he means Kwasi Zabantu, you know, you're an enemy of God, you're being led by Satan. Um, so they they wouldn't, one, one of the frustrating things about their response to the allegations is that something that they've pointed to consistently to try and prove that they're not a cult is their kind of um, openness to having other preachers and ministers come to their conferences and things like that. Now, that, that means absolutely nothing because while, while that's true and they do allow people from the outside to, to come speak and things like that, the problem is, is that if you're actually a member of the mission and let's say you decided you wanted to go to join one of the churches of one of these visiting ministers, you would still be deemed as apostate. So th there's this very clear double standard where they're only showing you half, you know, one side of the coin. Mm -hmm. But what they're neglecting to tell you is that once you're entrenched in KSB and you're considered a, a legitimate member, any deviation from KSB is considered as, you know, heretical and disloyal to the mission. And therefore it gives them the impetus to, to literally disfellowship and um, excommunicate you, including if it's your own family. And in fact, you will feel a great amount of pressure to do just that. You know. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So I've got two more things I want to touch on. And then I think I've used a lot of your time. So I don't know if you happy to do another, another episode next week, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So the, the first one is the, so I'm not obviously very clued up about the, the laws around schooling in, in Australia. I know that here up to a certain age, children have to go to school. So that is, it's, mm -hmm. it's part of our child child protection act. And, and there's a lot of laws around it. And some um, of the, less great religions that have yanked kids out of school and not given them schooling have actually been taken on about it here. Um, mm -hmm. So what is, what is that law? What is that law? Or is there a similar law in Australia? So I, you said that they leave school in around about high school, but is there well, a yeah. that they have to be in school? Otherwise they would probably not have them in school. 
Right. So it's changed over the years. So when I was when I was kind of in my early to mid teens, I believe the legal leaving age from school was 15 or 16. Now, what there was a loophole in the law where if as a parent you you could write into the education department or something like that and basically exempt your child from needing to even go to the age of 15 or 16 and and some of the parents in the church did do that um so they pulled their their children out of school even younger than the legal age through this this kind of loophole so that they could work and and just because they didn't think much of education um so that's definitely something that happened um, I'm actually not exactly sure what the, the age is now. I think it might be 16 or 17. They, they pushed it up very slightly at some point. Okay. And that loophole, does it still exist? I have no idea. Okay, okay. no, <laughs> really that's fine. Sure, yeah. yeah, no, that's fine. And then the other question I had, um, here we know that they pay minimum wage at the bottling plant and the, the stores and things. So... Uh, is it the same in Australia or do you have like certain like labor laws or, or basic, we've got the basic employment act here where you kind of have, there's a minimum you can pay people. There's a minimum where you can treat people. And, and I know in South Africa, it's very much employee focused, the, these laws. So to protect employees, but is there anything like that in Australia or, or do they just kind of pay them what they feel like? Uh, no, we definitely have laws re relating to kind of like in the church, you weren't really allowed to question why things were done a certain way. And um, yeah, it, it wasn't a pleasant working environment at all. I, I'm not exactly sure, you know, I'm, I'm not sure whether it was quite the same as in South Africa, where there were some like really large scale legal problems um, that existed. There. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thanks for your time. <laughs> no worries. And then we will chat again soon. Sure. Sounds okay. good. Thanks. Thank you. I would like to thank Daniel for his time and the amazing insights that he gave us. Fortunately, we get to do it all again next week. If you'd like to follow Daniel on Twitter, his Twitter handle is ComposerDan90. That's with a capital C and a capital D. I will post it in the show notes. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button and rate and review us. It will go a long way into improving the podcast and helping others find it. Please also share it with your friends and family. You can find us on Facebook and you can email us at decodingcults at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. If there are any topics around the workings of cults which you would like further explanation on, or if there is a cult that you would like to hear about, email me or post it in the Facebook group. Remember to go and check out By Design Crafts SA and Endeavor AV and tell them that we sent you. This week, I want to thank my local South African listeners again for your gracious support. The amazing logo art was created by the tattoo artist Jock Jacobs. Thank you so much for listening.